Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for um, attending this event. Um, some of you are also participating in ECA, so it's, uh, it's not just around the corner. So thanks for joining us here for the discussions today. Uh, my name is Alexandre Fernandes. I'm the development director at IID Europe. Um, and together with IID, we're organizing this event. So you may know that this is a side event to the sixth European Climate Change Adaptation Conference, which is taking place here in Dublin. Um, and what we really want to do uh, is to look and learn, uh, getting insights from climate adaptation practitioners around the world and how that they can inspire and inform uh, ambitious climate action in Europe. So a few words about IID Europe and IID, most of you uh, may know uh, IID is in a, an independent policy and action research organization uh, based in the Netherlands. Uh, and our main focus is on global environmental and social change, including the impacts of European actors. Um, the, we partner closely with IID, uh, which is one of, one of the world's uh, leading independent policy and action research institutions. Um, and uh, they have a 50-year track record of working on sustainable development and on linking um, global or local actions to global challenges. Uh, so this is a joint effort and a joint side event from organized by both uh, institutions. Um, and what we would like to do now briefly, Tom will then tell you a bit more about uh, how we plan to run the session today. But uh, just to quickly let you know that we will have an inter interactive poll where we want to hear from you in terms of challenges and barriers. Uh, then we will have a speaker coming and presenting some of the key messages from an international conference on community-based adaptation. Uh, and finally, we will open uh, a discussion with the panel and with the audience on uh, some reflections uh, on, on these messages. Um, so our first uh, speaker is Dr. Sheenad Walsh. Uh, she will be saying some uh, opening words at the event today. Uh, uh, Dr. Sheenad Walsh is the Climate Director at Ireland's Department of Foreign Affairs since 2020. Uh, before, she served as the EU Ambassador to South Sudan. Uh, prior to that, she has been the Ambassador of Ireland to Sierra Leone and Liberia, and she held several roles at the Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, Shined also has uh, more than 10 years of experience in the NGO sector, working in various countries around the world. So, uh, Shined, I will invite you to. Th thanks say a, a few lot, words. Uh, Thank you. Alex. Yeah, delighted to, to be here. Uh, this is a, a really gorgeous room. I think this is probably, for those of you who are not based in Dublin, it's probably the nicest meeting room we have. Uh, so, you're very welcome. Um, I know you're down in Dublin Castle, which is also. Quite nice. I mean, it, it varies. You know, it's, it's different different uh, time zones going on in Dublin Castle. But uh, I, I love this room, and I think it's always it's always a privilege when we get to have meetings here. Um, I, I, I'm going to situate uh, you a little bit more uh, by just taking a couple of moments to to talk a bit about Ireland's relationship with um, adaptation um, in in developing countries before before we start hearing from, uh, from, from the experts and the practitioners. And, and I understand uh, from, from Tom that this is the first time uh, that ECA has kind of uh, ventured into this territory of, of learning from developing countries, which is, which is really great because I'll be honest, it's also the first time that we're engaging with ECA um, as, as a, you know, a, a team uh, in the Department of Foreign Affairs that very much focuses on adaptation in, in developing countries. Um, so, so, so it's 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 great to to have the opportunity. Um, I, I suppose in 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 brief, um, adaptation is the main focus of what Ireland does on on climate action in in developing countries, uh, both in terms of our finance uh, and in terms of our diplomacy. So, 
Uh, in terms of our finance, we have a very strong focus on uh, the least developed countries and small island developing states. Uh, and about 96% of our funding is either going only to adaptation or going to programs where adaptation is, is one of the components. Um, so, so it's a very strong focus. And, and you, you may or may not know that we're in the process of uh, doubling our climate finance uh, in the course of a three and a half year period after 2025. So it's a pretty, uh, it's pretty, pretty ambitious, uh, which effectively means doubling our, our adaptation uh, finance as well. Um, so, so I think that's very, uh, that's very positive. Um, and then in diplomacy terms, we, we do quite a bit as well on, on adaptation. So, and, and actually work a lot with, with IED in this. Um, we, we, we're co-founders of something called the Champions Group on Adaptation Finance, um, looking at issues of quality of, of that finance, looking at, at issues of, of access of developing countries, particularly the more vulnerable um, developing countries uh, to, to, climate fi to, to adaptation finance. Um, so as I say, it, it, is really, um, it is really most of, of what, we're, uh, what we're involved in. And I suppose just a couple of, of, of um, kind of observations, uh, um, you know, before we kick off the session, I think we are, I suppose, really struck, um, you know, in the work that we do, which is, which is through our sort of Irish aid offices in the various embassies, which is mo mostly in Africa, um, and through civil society organizations, through multilateral partners, and um, we're really struck uh, for this, you know, the real urgency around, you know, this 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 phrase of, of transformational uh, adaptation. I think we were very struck earlier in the year and in, in, in quite happy that the IPCC uh, report talked about maladaptation because I think w what we're seeing is it is really quite worrying in terms of maybe doing more harm than good in some cases, and so we really need uh, we really need transfer transformational adaptation, and 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 I suppose part of what we what we mean by that is is adaptation work in, in developing countries that is. Um, you know that is 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 cross uh, sectoral. That is not sort of siloed. That is 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 very much connected in with, you know, your agriculture and food systems uh, work with your with your um, uh, you know your social protection, you know, with 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 you know local economies and so on. And and that of course means, you know, uh, looking very carefully at how we involve communities. And and we do quite a bit of work with with IED and others, um, on you know locally led adaptation and and trying to. You know, sort of flip the current situation where um, you know most adaptation finance is going to developing countries is not going directly to to the local level, but is often getting kind of um, stuck along the way. You know, some of which is valid, of course. You need some adaptation actions at at national level and so on. But we think there's a lot more uh, where where the finance needs to to go straight to to the community level for for activities there. Um, so we're, we're doing uh, quite a lot of work supporting uh, community level adaptation um, and also, as I said, trying to, in our own work as well, in our own health programs and agriculture programs and, and education programs, trying to see how we kind of you know, climate proof those um, so that we are not also encouraging this, this siloed approach to, um, to adaptation. Um, so I'll, I'll maybe leave it at that. Uh, keen, keen to listen to uh, to the panelists, and um, yeah, and, and, and just yeah, nice to be interacting with those of you who are focusing much more on a European context, because I do think we often uh, don't uh, don't interact actually <laughs> between what's going on uh, at at the level of a fora like ECA and what we do ourselves. So um, so happy to be here, and I'll I'll pass the mic back to Alex, maybe. Yeah, th thank you very much, uh, Shinet, for those opening words. Uh, I will now give the floor to Tom Mitchell, who will set the scene for the session today. So maybe just a brief introdu introduction to Tom. Uh, Tom Mitchell is the executive director at IIED, uh, steering the overall direction and leadership of the institute. Prior to joining IID, uh, Tom was the Chief Strategy Officer at Climate Kick and also the Director of the Climate Kick International Foundation. Tom is also the f a former coordinating lead author for the IPCC and a UN Special Representative Senior Advisor. So, Tom, over to you. Thank you, Alex, and, uh, and delighted to be here in such a beautiful venue. 
I was taking pictures as I came in, sending them to my family, saying it doesn't, doesn't get much better than this, does it really? Really incredible. Um, but welcome to everybody as well. So I think part of the motivation um, for uh, this session also comes from partly a personal experience that I've had of working on European adaptation issues and working on adaptation issues in, in Africa and in Asia, and quite frankly, being really frustrated that there isn't a dialogue between the two. There isn't a shared reflection about uh, how we can get together, learn those lessons, expand and scale what works, and do so in a way that is actually somewhat geographically agnostic. Why does it matter that there is a sense that there's continental boundaries when actually we're sharing challenges? And so that is part of the motivation here. I think what I've also come to understand from uh, working on adaptation issues in countries that have been really challenged with the impacts of climate change, in some cases over many decades now, is that Europe is beginning to ans ask some of the questions that have been dealt with in those locations, or at least have been grappled with in those locations for those many years. So for example, sitting in the ECHA conference, what I've heard is how do we reach the most vulnerable people in European society to help them with adaptation? How do we get money and resources to the local level when at the moment it's getting stuck? How do we acknowledge that there are parts of Europe that are now seeing the impacts of climate change that haven't been experienced before and don't have a set of inbuilt knowledge and kind of cultural history of working and dealing with those challenges? How do we create more cooperation between different places in tackling shared challenges? And in some ways, it's very frustrating, I feel, that there has been not yet a kind of a very pragmatic look and say, well, how do you build bridges? How do you build bridges between communities? How do you build bridges between governments and so on? And I think, and I, I know Sinead didn't say this, but I'm gonna make it a challenge for Ireland as I, I do for other countries, is to say how many occasions do you have the Ministry of Foreign Affairs working on adaptation in other countries, work together with the ministries of science and technology, looking and grappling with research challenges on these topics, and the domestic agenda, which is grappling with adaptation challenges now in the country. Really very limited cooperation across Europe around that. And I think also, to be quite honest, we see at a European Commission level that the adaptation strategy of the European Commission talks about the fact, I think it's in pillar number four of the agenda, four, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, is that we uh, Europe should be learning from places around the world. It says that in black and white. Yet, quite honestly, very, very little has been done so far. And I think there's good reasons for that. There's issues of politics and resourcing, but why not? It's a really pragmatic opportunity to bring together those types of organizations. And so uh, as we segue into the session and to hear from, from the panelists and contributors, um, just to set the scene here is that IIED has for uh, some time been running and supporting a conference called Community-Based Adaptation Conference, which brings together practitioners from around the world, often not from Europe, but from around the world to share lessons on the practical opportunities for tackling loss and damage with communities and in a way that is locally led. And so our opportunity today is to hear from some of those, um, to listen to the outcomes of the conference that we just held, and I'm going to pass on very shortly to, to Obed later in the session, um, and to then reflect back on what Europe can be taking away as key lessons from that. Now, I think what the beauty of this session also is, is we've got community organizations from Europe who are also going to be talking about their experiences. And the idea, I really hope we can leave this session with a sense that this can't be the first and only time that ECHA grapples with a topic like this, and it can't be the only way in which Europe and other parts of the world build bridges around shared challenges. And so I really look forward to the dialogue. I think this is a great opportunity to kick something off. And I think it's really welcome that the ECHA organizers have, have been able to um, create the space in the agenda to be able to have what I hope is a really innovative conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you very much, Tom. So what I would like to do now is to segue into an inter interactive uh, part of the, of the session where we will 
launch uh, a poll, so a Mentimeter poll, uh, trying to capture what, in your view, are the challenges and barriers that your region or community is currently facing, but also the opportunities that you see uh, working on um, community or locally based adaptation. So um, you can go, so this is the interactive part of the session, you can go to menti.com. Uh, if you enter the code 39916642, and we should have some results coming in soon. So I'll give you maybe one or two more minutes to then. We have three questions. Okay. Um, so we've had uh, the interactive question that we had in terms of location. I see that there were several um, participants from Europe, Ireland, UK, uh, but also Mexico, Bolivia, US. So it's interesting to see uh, this representation at the global level. Now in terms of main challenges, uh, what are the main challenges that regions and communities face in terms of um, adapting? One issue is, as uh, Tom was already alluding to, this lack of long-term and predictable finance. Um, the, in terms of how do you fit, in terms of priorities, resilience with all the other challenges and particularly the cost of living crisis, which is quite current now. The issue of equity justice, also the knowledge gaps, uh, the access to finance, again, is, uh, it seems to be a key uh, gap. Um, I see that it's quite, uh, uh, it had several hits here, so I think that's, it's clearly one of the key uh, issues, how uh, communities and regions access directly to finance to help them uh, with their adaptation plans. Um, and the last one, of course, also, how do we go beyond this project-based cycle funding uh, and have it on a more sustainable and long-term uh, basis? Um, so, yeah, I see several. So thank you very much for your uh, contribution. I see lots of inputs. Uh, re finance has been repeated several times, um, also this uh, lack of coordination between actors at the national level and at the local level. So I hope that um, some of these, I think we will use this to segue into the uh, discussions, both in the panel, but first what we would like to do is uh, some of these challenges will um, strike a balance and will be shared in a similar way, both from European regions uh, but also regions in the global south. And as Tom mentioned earlier, um, we would like to hear some of the discussions and key messages that, uh, that from the uh, International Conference on Community-Based Adaptation that IID recently organized and how some of these are also reflected on the key messages and insights. So to uh, transition, um, the messages from CBA then into the panel discussion. So to do that, I would like to bring in Obed Coringo. I think he should be with us. Obed, are you with us? Yeah. Yes, yes. I'm with you. Um, yes. You can make me the host so that I can uh, share my screen. Perfect. Let me just briefly introduce you, Obed. Um, yes, please. So Obed Coringo works with Care International as a climate policy advisor, uh, where he provides technical assistance to programs in Africa and Asia on evidence-based climate policy. Uh, Obed has more than 20, uh, 12 years of experience in climate policy and analysis, and also on climate advocacy. And he has also a long experience working across a range of actors, including NGOs, governments, and grassroots organizations. So Obed will now share with us some of the key messages and insights that came from this uh, community-based adaptation. 
uh, and then the panel discussion, the panelists will reflect uh, on some of these insights and key messages and how we can find similarities between some of these challenges and challenges that Europe is facing and how we can learn from each other. So, Obed, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, lovely introduction. Uh, as you have heard, my name is Obed Koringo and I work with Care International. I am dialing in from Nairobi, Kenya, and I was one of the participants in the 17th Conference of uh, Community-Based Adaptation, which was organized by IID and other partners, as you can see, some of them who are uh, reflected in this slide. And uh, just to um, today, I'm going to share a few insights and lessons from the CBA 17 conference. It, this was the first uh, physical uh, conference after three years, of course, uh, due to COVID. The three previous CBA, CBA 14, 15, and 16, were held virtually. And they were really, really happy to meet uh, physically to be able to interact with a, a number of practitioners and get to learn from each other. So basically, uh, CBA uh, was uh, an annual, as an annual gathering that uh, had around 250 uh, climate adaptation practitioners from all over the world. And uh, this basically is a, is, a, is a space for practitioners and to be able to share the, their knowledge and learning about, about uh, the practice of local adaptation. And uh, this year's uh, conference was themed local solutions uh, inspiring global action and was really a very good space for adaptation practitioners, grassroots communities uh, and representatives and, and local national government planners and policymakers uh, to be able to come together to, to, to discuss, exchange ideas and best practices uh, on, on adaptation. And so we had a number of uh, themes uh, in this conference, uh, climate finance, nature-based solutions, uh, innovation, youth leadership, and decolonizing climate action. And of course, the focus was on locally led adaptation, which uh, centers uh, on, on local actors, subsidiarity, uh, and also transformative change. Uh, in terms of the uh, nature-based solutions, uh, some of the key messages that came uh, from out from this uh, uh, theme, uh, uh, the, the, the conference participants really felt that many nature-based solutions are too simplistic. And, and they, they, they also, I mean, majorly talk about ponds in urban spaces and, and many poorly considered uh, solutions, uh, particularly in urban areas, uh, focus on overly simplified initiatives that are not integrated into planning and development. So um, the, the message was uh, the need to integrate nature-based solutions uh, into planning processes. Then uh, another message on, on, on nature-based solutions around multiple um, uh, perspect uh, perspectives or actors that are required. And of course, they really need to establish coordinating institutions to be able to bring together community engineers, uh, scientific scientists, governments, be able to work together in partnership uh, with, with planning. Then uh, last but not least, uh, local knowledge really matters. And uh, of course, we've seen a lot of proliferation and jargon on uh, and inadequate resources and, and for local governments, which excludes vital local resources. It's worth noting that uh, indigenous people or indigenous knowledge, uh, indigenous women, local communities are already championing nature-based solutions and hold valuable traditional knowledge, building the decades of experiences uh, of implementing them. And they really need to uh, see how we can include this vital resource in uh, discussions and programming around nature-based solution. On climate finance, uh, of course, this, this theme uh, explored how funders, donors, and their intermediaries uh, that channel funds and local actors uh, that often implement them, uh, how they function together, and the challenge changes that need to facilitate uh, locally-led action. And uh, the main one of the main messages are, is around, was around sharing the burden of risk across the chain of actors. Donors and, and intermediaries and local actors really need to be open with each other about the risks involved in delivering adaptation. They, they really need to recognize and be open about how local organizations face existential reputation and personal risk in case of failure. So being really open uh, 
to finding a middle ground that openly recognizes and distributes risks uh, fairly is really a very uh, fast step. Uh, and of course, uh, in this, in, in sharing the burden of, of risk, then uh, we really need to work with the existing government systems. However flawed uh, these systems are, they, they uh, can reveal opportunities to improve them and, and also will be necessary for large scale adaptation finance uh, to work sustainably in the long run. So, uh, and they will be able to continue after funding programs have programs gone. Uh, uh, then of course, in terms of flexibility, this is also something that have, uh, has also come up in, 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 the, in the poll. Uh, there's a need for flexibility for local organization to be able to apply uh, their knowledge of and, and on the context. And finance must allow adaptive management, including regular and better coordination, uh, communication and establishing collaborative processes that enhance the community's capacity uh, according to their needs. Then uh, the third uh, theme was around innovation for adaptation. And you know, one of the key messages around innovation was that uh, innovation really doesn't necessarily mean complex things. It also means uh, also involves simple solutions that work. And uh, too much innovation currently seems to be about uh, uh, innovation for its own sake. There's a lot of proliferation uh, or around pilots and accelerators, uh, and, and, and they just really need to, uh, I mean, identify new development without enough attention uh, to sustainably or scaling up. So the message was these pilots and accelerators really need to recognize the route to scale and sustainable long-term benefits. Uh, there's also another aspect around enabling environment to, uh, which includes finance, regulation, policy, community engagement, to work together, be able to foster successful, locally uh, relevant uh, adaptation. And uh, also the other element was around the, the role of inter interna international intermediaries, for instance, which uh, play a key role in acting as knowledge brokers and, and that can bring, bring in experience and learning from elsewhere and amplify what can uh, be shared positive uh, developments to, to attract investment. So the role of intermediaries really is very, really, really key in ensuring that, of course, uh, we support innovation and locally led solutions and considering that communities already know what, what they need to do. They have locally led uh, sort of information that uh, they already have. How can we elevate them? How can we work with them to develop solutions that really work uh, to address the unique challenge that they are facing without necessarily uh, putting solutions or technologies that uh, do not address their needs? In terms of youth, uh, youth leadership, uh, of course, the youth play a key role in, in adaptation and they really need to be meaningfully engaged in this process. And we really need to uh, find a way of establishing intergenerational dialogue to be able to bridge the divide in, in the priorities. So ensure that we are able to mentor and, and, and uh, foster networks and, and support youth networks to be able to engage meaningfully uh, in, in this process. Uh, youth are also more than just activists. They must be funded to be able to, cap, cap, I mean, to, to be capable advocates for their own community needs. Uh, then, of course, we really need to have uh, direct routes to communicating through social media and easier for use of digital tools, which is a key resource to be able to draw on and pay uh, youth for. Uh, last but not least, we had uh, this uh, new thematic area on decolonizing climate action. And, and, and uh, this theme explored how to resolve the tensions caused by the colonial legacies that continue to shape adaptation in the global uh, South. And of course, one of the messages around this theme was uh, recognizing, uh, I mean, uh, power dynamics really need to be analyzed uh, between donors, intermediaries, and communities to be able to reduce top-down ways of working by donors uh, uh, because they need to engage directly with local communities. So recognizing the value of indigenous or local knowledge of context, environment, and politics is, is really, really key. And of course, they really need to build direct relationships between funders and local organizations uh, to be able to foster dialogue and an understanding between them.
then last but not least, funding programs need to allow for adaptive management, room to fail and to learn. They really uh, are currently too restrictive and of, of course focused on success. Uh, but of course the main message here was really need to be flexible to allow for failure uh, so that we can learn uh, from, from, the, from failure and also draw lessons from, from failing. Sometimes of course not really focusing much on, on, on success, but failing forward. Thank you so much. I will like to stop here. So thank you very much, Obed, for those key messages and insights. Um, what I would like to do now is uh, the next step will be we will have a set of panelists reflecting on some of these key messages and insights. Uh, but while the panel is being set up, maybe I'll just quickly open the floor if there are some brief reflections or comments before we move on to the panel discussion. Yeah. There's a microphone. Here. Thank you. Thanks. My name is Montserrat Boring from Wageningen University, and I'm uh, originally Mexican, um, but I have experience also working in Africa. Um, my question is also like, how do you address, um, yeah, gender equality or inequality, depending how you see the glass, how healthy or how half full, but. Um, I know that there's also a lot of issues on incorporating a gender in, in the climate agenda and adaptation in many local communities, mainly because, of course, uh, women have uh, less rights, for instance, uh, lack of access to, to land or um, other several um, uh, issues uh, at the local level. So uh, how do you address gender? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would suggest that we take your question then to the panel discussion, but just to, to inform that. Um, so if that's okay, I'll pass the floor to Tom. Uh, is it okay? So we're going to move on then, as Alex said, to the panel discussion, of which you see the cast of characters that we're going to have up on the screen. Um, I'd like to invite Martha and Thomas to come and join us here up on the stage, and then uh, Obed and Shanaz will be online. And for those who are just joining, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to do what Alex did and kind of read out some, some uh, um, esteemed comments about the uh, you know, incredible experience of each panelist, but I would love them to express that in their own words um, because they'll do a certainly a much better job than I will. Um, but just to say, on this panel, we're going to be looking at how the insights from community-based adaptation that Abed has just been sharing um, can be relevant for Europe and for European regions and communities, um, particularly as, if, as, as the challenges of building resilience to climate change become ever more urgent. So that's the topic of our panel. But what you'll see here is a mix of people coming from uh, European context from Ireland, and then also uh, Obed and Shanaz are going to join us and add the perspective from, from Africa and in other parts of the world. Um, but maybe let's just take the opportunity for each panelist to say hello and talk about where they're coming into this panel from. Um, and then we'll move on to a kind of set of questions and reflections. But Martha, maybe I could start with you and pass the... Let me just work out how to do this so that we don't get ourselves in a tangle. Brilliant. Thank you. Can, does that work? Yeah, great. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks uh, for inviting me. Uh, my name is Martha Farrell, and I am a, a director and co-founder of a community-led, 100% volunteer-run charity in the southwest of Ireland called, it's a long name, Maharese Conservation Association. And we are um, seven years in the running we set up to protect our very fragile tombolo that um, is located on the southwest of Ireland. Um, very low lying, very fragile and um, vulnerable to climate change impacts. And we, I suppose, set up as a result of a crisis uh, seven years ago when the only road in and out of the access, uh, the only access road in and out of the residential area in Maharese became blocked with three to four foot sand drifts 
uh, primarily because of Atlantic storms, but also because of a, a degraded dune system. And we set about taking community action, nature ba using nature-based solutions to protect our sand dune system. Because for us, um, while sand dunes provide a, a range of ecosystems, goods and services, for us, they are a shield from storm damage, um, storm surges, and they're also a really um, biodiverse habitat. So um, we um, have been very successful in our activity so far, and I'm going to speak today on our experience. So I'll pass it over to you, Tom. Thank you. Um, and <clears throat> first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to sit on the panel in this indeed very, very lovely room. Um, very honored <clears throat> and also honored to learn a lot in, um, already by the presentation from Obed and, and others. So my name is Thomas Kurtz. I am um, now working Climate Kick. Um, Tom and I did a little bit of a handover over a few months. <laughs> I joined Climate Kick um, to now work as the senior advisor on climate neutral and resilient regions. Um, in particular, now I've focused on coordinating, bringing together the various projects we are involved in in the context of the EU mission on adaptation. And, and that's what I did before joining Climate Kick. I was actually part of the European Commission. Um, uh, is, is, exploring and then in drafting the EU emission adaptation um, as it now is being implemented. Um, before that, I was seven years in the United Nations working on the head of work program in IPBES, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. So I have a bit of a UN and global background as well. But very different to my colleague next to me here, my experience is more coming from public administration and from the uh, sort of more multilevel, multinational aspects. And I have very little local experience, which now shall change as we now actually in the context of the work we are doing in Climate Kick work with um, a lot of European regions and, um, for example, the project I'm also here to represent, um, Pathway to Resilience, um, we are to support 100 European regions and communities in developing um, transformational adaptation strategies and their implementation um, plans. Um, and so um, th this is really something where I am very much looking forward to and I'm absolutely convinced that we will learn from um, the experiences um, around the global south um, as these uh, regions have been grappling, as Tom said, with these issues way ahead of time um, with these issues. And so I'm very much looking forward to that exchange. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, and we've already heard from Abed, but Abed, if you wanted to add anything into this in terms of um, your uh, kind of reflections into this panel, um, you're very welcome. I don't want to take much of the time. I already introduced myself. And uh, if, if there's anyone that has just joined, my name is Obed Koringo, and I work with the CARE International. I'm a climate policy advisor, and my role basically is supporting country offices on climate uh, adaptation policies and also uh, engaging southern uh, CSOs on uh, influencing uh, uh, policy on adaptation. So my the link between local and, and global is also really, really key in, in my work. And uh, I look forward to interacting with you. Thank you so much. And last by very no means least, another wonderful ex-colleague, Shanaz. Uh, Shanaz, over to you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Tom. And I'm quite jealous as you all compl uh, explain to us about this beautiful room you're sitting in. Um, I'm Shanaz. I'm a director at South South North, the space. Okay, let me just, I come from a hardcore engineering background. And I realized that the way we were designing things, it's it was part of the problem. And then that's how I got into the climate space. Um, we work very much in the knowledge brokering space. And so for me, it's really interesting that this narrative around capacity strengthening and ad adaptation is shifting. Because in the beginning, it was always about what capacity do we need in the South so that we had adaptation? 
adaptation and yet adaptation was happening because communities were still there. So I'm very excited to hear the, 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 the North saying we need to adapt and we can learn from the South. And I think as knowledge brokers, we play quite an important role in that flow of knowledge. Actually, now it's feeling like it's more from the South to the North. So, yeah, so that's a bit of my background. Back to you, Tom. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And uh, I think you'll agree that there's an excellent panel to reflect on these challenges. Um, Martha, maybe I could start with you. <laughs> um, I was very struck by Obed's comments around the challenges associated with financing locally led uh, uh, local projects around climate adaptation. And the fact that in many countries around the world, as I understand it, they've been grappling with different ways of getting resources to the local level and trying to, as, as Sinead highlighted earlier, uh, make that as efficient as possible and, uh, and reduce the barriers to entry. But of course, it's still not easy and there are risks. But it would be really cool if you could just think through and reflect to us what your experience is here and what you think, uh, from what you've already heard, might be able to be applied in in the context in Ireland. And then I'll pass on to Thomas to also reflect across other regions in Europe. Um, so funding, in our experience, is um, something we, we've had to grapple with, for sure, uh, accessing funding. Um, and I suppose, you know, when I was considering, you know, what are the challenges, funding um, is related to funding community-led action, but also funding for nature, you know, actually funding the protection and the and the preservation of nature is another issue that we find anyway. Um, so we still don't have a systematic approach to accessing relatively small pots of funding for our nature-based solutions, for example. One of our nature, so marm grass planting for us is free of charge. We do it on a volunteer basis. We don't mind that. We found that this type of fencing called chestnut fencing is an excellent way of protecting a sand dune from human impacts, but it's incredibly expensive for us to buy. Uh, to put it in perspective, we've just spent um, around 7,000 euros buying uh, 500 meters of chestnut fencing to protect a, a stretch of, of sand dune that we, we think is critical to protect infrastructure behind it. And so how do we access funding for projects like this? We have our GoFundMes, we run local funding initiatives, and then we're trying to see if there's a state pot that we could that this project will sort of fit the theme of, and then you're looking maybe to your local government. But it's a lot of work for us, I suppose, to do, to scramble around to find this funding, to, to do something that's very basic, um, you know, a coastal defense, if you like. Um, so definitely funding that's more um, accessible for us as opposed to the huge life projects or the EIPs, where there's huge pools of funding being spent on, you know, one area, and then all of the other areas are left sort of, you know, without that um, easily accessible funding. And also we feel that we need to see funding being assigned to protect and restore nature. We have the Natura 2000 sites, we have European legislation, but I, know, I think in some areas such as ours, we could definitely do with more funding um, to, to fo fund wildlife rangers, wardens, um, you know, in areas of high nature value in particular. But I will also say that the funding issue is very much related to governance. So for us to access funding, we have to show good governance structures, um, you know, good reporting. We are a charity. We are a limited company. And, and there's a huge knowledge gap for communities. In my experience, we work with a lot of communities now who are trying to emulate what we're doing. And they are quite reluctant to become so formalized, you know, like us. And that is a, is a huge barrier to them then to access funding. So it's a knowledge gap, but it's funding. Really valuable points. Thomas, I wonder whether you can come in and reflect on this as well. So you're somebody who's been working, as you highlighted, at kind of multiple levels of government and reflecting on issues of kind of finance and access and so on. And now, I suppose, charged with sorting this out for 100 European regions. But I just wonder what your reflections are based on what you've heard and what Martha's been highlighting 
Is there kind of route here that we can really enable a kind of community layer to be able to act that we know needs to act on adaptation? Um, yes, I mean, it's a very interesting and, and, and challenging challenge in that sense. Um, one of the things to be said, I, I mean, we personally, um, or in this project with the 100 regions, we are in the beginning, we are not yet even have selected the hundreds we work with. So what we, and what I'm reflecting now is what we've heard, like m more through sort of, uh, sort of exchanges we have with, with certain um, players from these areas. Um, one of the things um, we encounter a lot, at least in the European context, is that in theory there, there is probably not enough, but there is substantive, significant money addressed to climate adaptation from the European Investment Bank, from through the structural funds or through other things. Um, you know, the, the European um, Commission um, or the European Union's multi-annual framework has dedicated up to 30% of its funding to, um, to, to climate action, including mitigation and adaptation. Now, does that reach the ground? And is that accessible from the local level? And that's where, where this gets more complicated. Um, and, and so a huge problem, what we hear from in the European context is, is that um, you know, as nice as these European programs may be laid out in addressing these things, it's incredibly difficult to bring this back together on the local level in a as it's needed systemic, integrated, cross covering, you know, cross sectoral approach. Um, and it has to do with lots of different things. That I mean, for example, the reporting requirements, the um, you know, the the, the bankability of projects, etc. What that takes, and sometimes it's it's even you know, smaller communities need smaller numbers of things, but, and I think Oban said it as well, but what you actually need, uh, you know, what the EIB doesn't give anything out beyond, you know, 20 million or something. So, I mean, they're, they're just these kind of barriers at the moment, which um, I understand our regions are faced a lot. And then you have only one person um, on the ground actually doing all this, right? So, and, and, and it's just, Impossible. So there's the the, the the irony is there is money around apparently, um, but it's impossible to be spent um, um, in this context at the moment. So we need to find other ways of mobilizing and empowering um, the local actors to to get there by whatever means. Um, one of the means, for example, we will provide in the context of this project, uh, pathway to resilience, is that in the context of these. We have a cascading call so where we distribute um, up to 300,000 euros per region, so altogether up to 21 million euros for the 100 together, for the regions to dedicate to this process. So they could eventually hire someone for a year or two to go with us through this project of actually then developing that. Um, and in this process, we will, and that's one of the main contributions of, of, of the project, we will also bring together and empower them in thinking through financing and finance implementation plans and helping them in really learning how to put together bankable projects. Um, and, um, and then that's exactly what I was just last week at a conference where the person from the IEB, the European Investment Bank, said we have they really want to scale up their expenditures on climate adaptation, but they don't find bankable projects. And so I think that's a huge gap where we can help, and I think I hear it's internationally very similar. We, we, can, we, we need to provide more support at the local level um, in order to get these things together. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. I, I want to put the question then, I suppose, to Shanaz in particular and to Obed, which is what we're hearing is that rapid direct access to reasonably modest amounts of money by community organizations who understands what needs to happen is really tough in a European context. There are lots of barriers to entry, there's lots of bureaucracy, and 
Equally, there is a sense that there are high degrees of accountability required because in some ways the European system doesn't trust those local actors without going through fairly extensive processes of due diligence or assessment of some financial system. I wonder, this has been an issue that has been present in many countries in Africa and in Asia and other parts of the world. I wonder whether you could reflect on where you've seen innovation or new ways of tackling this challenge that has seen resources flow to community organizations. Shanaz, is there something that you'd want to come in on? Um, yes, th thank you, Tom. Um, so it is quite a difficult um, issue. I think the question is not difficult. It, it's one that, that, that we grapple with quite a bit. And it is. It's this thing about the due diligence that's needed, et cetera. And what we see happening more and more is that the philanthropies are stepping in. They seem to have less tight to due diligence uh, um, components, and they passing money on via, but still via intermediaries to the communities. So if you look at what happened during COVID, communities were responding with little or no funding. Um, philanthropy stepped in, in in some instances in the Western Cape, which is here where I live, particularly where women and youth were involved because they were the ones um, acting and they gave their money. And I think there's a lot, lot of trust there. And so, so, so that seems to be working. What we also have, particularly in um, South Africa and amongst women, they call it a stock fell. There, there's no English translation for that. But women put um, every month, they put their money together and then they do things with it. And, and, and then different members of the stock fell get their money out. And these sorts of, of existing long-term trusted mechanisms are being used by the philanthropists to get the monies to the community. So it's using existing structures that have been going forever. And I think the challenge to the, the, the traditional donors is that how do you make your due diligence fit for purpose so that you get what you want, but that the money also gets to where it's needed the most for the climate action? I think, yeah, I think for, yeah, that's, that, for now, that's it for me, Tom. Really valuable reflections. Obed, do you want to come in on this one? Yeah, yeah if I want to add from what Shanaza said, of course, uh, there's a push right now to, um, directly fund local communities or local organizations, but still, as Shenaza said, intermediaries still do not want to um, uh, sort of relinquish that. It's just a talk and talk and talk and about localization or local, ensuring that money gets to the local level. But how do we actually do that? And and if it's actually difficult in, in, in Europe, for instance, how about the South? It's much more difficult. And uh, what one thing that uh, um, the the southern or the south or even African governments have done or tried to do is ensure that the the right policy mechanism, institutional framework to be able to tap this funding, but the funding is not forthcoming. Uh, what I, I can share an example of Kenya, for instance. Uh, Kenya has a, um, a two tier governance system, national and and, and sub national, which is county governance system. And uh, what we have done is we have established these uh, devolved funding uh, mechanisms, which are called county climate change funding mechanisms, where uh, counties are, are able to develop mechanisms and policy uh, uh, laws that are able to en en enhance or ensure that they set aside a certain percentage of uh, their budget to fund local uh, adaptation or local climate actions. And I think this is a very, very clear or, or unique uh, sort of example that I can be replicated uh, to be able to uh, earn that trust from even the donors and, and, and the, the, the philanthropists to be able to fund uh, local climate uh, uh, actions. But but it's still a challenge. Of course, the national government sends money to the county governments and the county governments uses part of that budget 
through the county climate change funding uh, mechanism to be able to uh, uh, support or address uh, local climate challenges. But of course, there is no money. Uh, that's the the the, the 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 I mean, the bottom line is there's really really little money in terms of climate finance. And of course, that's where we are pushing for more finance to be able to go to uh, even developing countries to be able to go to directly to the communities that need that uh, finance. Thank you so much. I'd like to stop there. Thank you. I suppose then one of the conclusions we could take from that, and I'm, I suppose I'm particularly thinking about the Pathways to Resilience program, is that if there is 100 regions, each with the opportunity to access a reasonably modest amount of money for each region, I think let's be clear on that, but is there a way in which you can design at least a component of that that has minimum barrier, barriers to entry and can be accessed by community organizations reasonably quickly and easily in order to be able to support multiple different activities at the same time, of which I think we've got a model that Obed is highlighting in Kenya that may be one in which some of the design principles could be drawn on. So I'm just really trying to make sure that this panel looks at the kind of practical components as well of what we can take forward from that type of cooperation. Um, but I also want to move on to uh, a colleague's question from Mexico where you were talking about the kind of gender dimensions of adaptation actions and particularly the challenges of of, of gender inequalities uh, and how to, I suppose, there's a lot of discussion now about how to um, think of gender transformative adaptation programming. Um, and I wonder whether we could maybe reflect from members of the panel from outside Europe or focused outside Europe on how to tackle this question where I've heard from the ECHA conference now that there are many parts of Europe where there is a feeling that there is a significantly you know, unequal impact of climate change and that adaptation actions need to be able to address that. But maybe, Sinead, I could turn to you to start with and just say, well, this is something that Irish AIDS programming has at least considered for several years now. What kind of lessons? Yeah, no, thanks a million. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, I suppose I, I, I come from a bit of a different perspective on this because I'm not a, a sort of a climate person by background. I'm a development humanitarian person by background. And in those sectors, we have spent 80, 100 years, you know, working, learning lessons, making mistakes, you know. And, and, and one of my kind of bugbears, I suppose, is that there, there's a great deal of money now going into climate finance in developing countries, but sometimes it's almost like there's a new sector being set up um, of, of climate finance as though it's somehow to be treated differently to, uh, to, to um, you know, the other things that, that we've been working on for so long. So in other words, you know, to me, an adaptation program is a good development program, right? And if, if you have a development program that's not considering, you know, very seriously whether it needs to, uh, you know, integrate climate change uh, considerations because it almost inevitably will. Then that's not a good development program. So, so then to come back to, to come on to your actual question, I suppose I feel the same way about that. Like we've had uh, decades of um, trying to integrate gender considerations into development programs and into humanitarian programs. Um, and so to me, it's the same stuff and we shouldn't sort of, you know, create this uh, differentiation, um, you know, just because something is called a climate program. So in terms of what we do, um, we we would support, I suppose, uh, you know, we I suppose we would try to, to um, in the adaptation programs that we fund, you know, th through our partners and, and civil society organizations and, and, and through our embassies and so on, um, like we would try to hold our climate programs to those same standards, right? Because we would be generally, I think, we're generally in sort of considered in the top three or the top five uh, donors in the world in terms of of how we integrate in gender, it's, it's it's certainly one of our one of our strengths. So we we you know we're trying to 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 sort of hold our climate programs to to those same um, standards in terms of, you know how how we look at, at gender and and including how we how we bring women and girls into into programs. We also do some specific stuff when it comes to things like climate negotiations. We we support, you know, women's groups, for example, to send. 
um, you know, to, to 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 sort of be trained and then to go to climate negotiations. And, and a lot of a lot of these discussions, maybe at national level, might actually even be more meaningful than the cops and so on. But we do also support uh, women's groups to come to the cops, and and then through some of those partners, we we support women's groups who are involved in sort of you know community-based activities, kind of Martha, uh, like you're talking about yourself in in various developing countries. So so we do that as well. But I, I suppose the the point that I'd like to stress is is that I do, and Tom knows this very well. I do worry about this siloization of of climate programming and and how you know we shouldn't throw out all that we've learned, even though we've made a lot of mistakes in terms of of good practice generally in in other programs that we do in in developing countries and health and education and so on. And, and rather we should be trying to build on on all that experience of um, of, of inclusion in 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 terms of gender. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Shinaz, maybe I could turn to you. I think the perspective here is that across Europe, there are regions grappling with the impacts of climate change, of which they are incredibly um, diverse, actually. So from, from, uh, from those in Ireland that we're, we're, we're placed in Ireland at the moment through to uh, those in, in Eastern Europe, in, in, in Romania and in Bulgaria and those into Southern Europe that are really suffering from the impacts of drought. And then in, in Northern Europe with radically changing weather patterns and forest fires and so on, the range of diversity of this in Europe is really challenging and with significant migrant populations as well and, uh, and, and the fact of very unequal societies. And so I just wonder from, from your experience, what would your advice be to those who are trying to grapple with you know, inclusive adaptation programs in a way that um, they haven't had that experience necessarily so much before. Um, but what could we learn from the kind of body of, of the years of experience, I suppose, there have been in, in the programs that, that Sinead has been highlighting? Um, another difficult question, Tom. But um, I think it's important to... And CDKN has also shifted, or the work we're doing is, uh, has shifted a lot now to a bottom-up approach. Before we'd go in and take a very top, um, the, like an overview, whereas now we look, we're engaging with the communities, particularly the women and youth, and speaking to them, hearing their stories, and asking what is it that they need. And oftentimes it's they're asking for capacity strengthening to understand what's happening and access to usable knowledge. So I think particularly for our work, it's shifting the entry point to the local communities. And it means building longer term relationships. And when you're working with them, working with champions, but focusing on the women and the youth in particular, and also understanding the um, the culture, but particularly now with the, with the big migrant population in Europe, understanding the kind of the, the um, cultural nuances and working with that rather than trying to change it. So I think it's working with, first of all, understanding what is and then working with that system and understanding the entry points as well. Shanaz, thank you very much. Abed, anything that you'd like to add to this based on CARE's experience, for example? Yeah, uh, when it comes to, of course, the issue of gender, uh, and care, care is really very, very specific even in our programming. And we actually have an impact area on gender with clear indicators or gender markers, even in our program that we report uh, in, in, uh, whenever we implement our programs. Uh, of course, uh, I, I want to say that, of course, men and women are affected in, in different ways uh, by, by by climate change and of course responses need to be recognized how climate impacts affect women, men, old and young, and those who are educated and not educated. And interventions also really must uh, be able to to recognize that these differences are, and and uh, are yet be accessible to all groups uh, to ensure that they are supporting people of different types of vulnerabilities. And of course, uh, it goes without saying that women and 
and youth and ageism change uh, and as we have had and and key players in in the climate intersectionalities and should recognize their added vulnerabilities climate change but also their agency and the solutions uh, that they bring uh, to, to the table i uh, just wanted to uh, one of the key messages that, of course, that came out of the CBA, for instance, is that uh, these communities, of course, uh, women, youth, have they, they have the relevant local lo knowledge and solutions, uh, which should be the first building uh, block for any adaptation action, and and of, of course on the ground before introducing any new solutions that we think works uh, works for them. So it's about using local knowledge and resources to be able to creatively fight. The impacts of climate change, and this is as care what we stand for. Thank you so much. Maybe then I can pass back to a kind of European contingent and ask similar questions. Um, Martha, I wonder how how you're tackling this. Yeah, for me, it's it's essentially a governance issue again. Um, and I and you know we were talking about it in relation to funding and how you know bureaucracy. I I, I don't um, I don't want to discount the bureaucracy because I do think there needs to be transparency and 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 proper accounting for use of funds. I I don't um, discount it for a second, but I think there's a knowledge gap among community groups. Uh, in Ireland, from what I can see, in setting up properly. And so to the issue of inclusion and gender, um, I think when you set up properly and have your proper structure, governance practices and systems, then it, it, it automatically deals with that issue. So from our perspective, good governance means if we're acting for a community, that we are really making sure that that community has got a chance to participate in some participatory planning process. Um, obviously, there are workshops, there are you know online surveys you can do, but for us, actually, it's a question of how do we get to the people who will never turn up at a community workshop? So how do we design a piece of research where perhaps we are starting out with a lot of qualitative research, uh, something like design thinking, where we're asking people to describe their vision of this place as we go forward. And it won't just deal with climate change, it will deal with a whole plethora of issues. Um, and, and gender inequality could be one of them. And so setting out with that a proper understanding of a community's needs and then communicating and then you know outreaching and stakeholder mapping and all of that i think it's all part of forming a strong institution and thomas i think i'm i'm going to be kind of kind in a sense that it's very early days um but i know that one of the the goals of the mission was to try and reach uh, many different communities across Europe and engage them in the type of discussion that Martha's highlighting around their future in the context of a changing climate. Have you got a sense of how you would manage that from kind of Ireland to Bulgaria and from Finland to Malta, recognizing the really quite different uh, approaches to inclusion and, and kind of cultural sensitivities? Mm. Thank you for being kind, and yet, uh, no, but um, <clears throat> the, so the d different levels of responses to that, I mean, on the one hand, the, the, mis the mission as such has, uh, you know, has now launched, I mean, or will launch, I, I don't know how many, 50, 60, or 70 different uh, research and innovation projects that each one address uh, you know, a range of regions and communities in different ways. So that's in addition to the one we do and where we reach out to 100. So there's a lot of overlaying different projects and all of them, and that's a standard text which is always included in the calls for these research, all of them make very explicit the need to um, make sure that the most vulnerable are um, being reached out to and that there's the inclusion of minorities um, and or uh, vulnerable um, uh, sort of uh, stakeholders or people, actors, um, and there's also explicit reference for gender, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's all taken care of in, in, in a formalistic way um, through the mission as such. That was my previous hat, as I promised um, to replace that view here as well, because Philip Tulkins from the Commission couldn't make it. Um, <clears throat> so, but a part of that, um, I say so what we want to do in the context of our Pathway to Resilience project, the 100 regions, 
and there, our project doesn't get directly involved with the local level. Um, it is the cascading grants that are given, um, which will itself contain certain obligations of inclusion and making sure that certain that the local partner that will receive that money or funding will take care of this. So there will be um, obligations to do that. And it's then in the hands of that local actor to, to include that. And, and we would ask that from the, from the supporting or capacity building side of the partnership or the, the consortium, we would support these local actors that are carrying out and owning that, uh, that project, so to speak. We would support them with any sort of best practice or, or um, facilitation and, and training modules, et cetera, et cetera. got a few minutes left for the panel. I wonder whether there's anybody in the audience that would like to pose a question to any of the panelists. Yes, sir. Two at the back. Maybe we can take just a small batch of questions and then give panelists the opportunity to respond to whichever ones they feel most comfortable with. But is there a microphone? Ah, you have. Okay, just if you could put your hands up. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Wolfgang Pfefferkorn from CIPRA International. I'm a regional planner uh, in the Alpine area. And I'm wondering a bit, because we are not reinventing the wheel here, uh, also as regards European programs that touch the ground. We have, for example, Interreg, we have the LEADER program. The LEADER program has been working bottom up at local level for more than 20 years. There are thousands of regions in Europe that receive money for implementing local projects also in the field of climate mitigation and climate adaptation. So I would think at the European level at least, there is no lack in money that comes down to the ground, to the municipalities. There is more a lack of awareness or a lack of knowledge how to make use of this. And I think uh, I really appreciate a lot um, the mission on adaptation. I think it fits very well. It's exactly what is needed to make research uh, going out. But I think uh, what is missing is the linkage between different European funds and their actors. Thank you. Um, let me maybe take the other questions first. I know you're very keen to respond, but let's just take a batch of those. Is, uh, that's it. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, the director of the Bass Center for Climate Change. I'm coming from the research community, but they have a background on international cooperation, working of the UN system and, and so on. So it is quite interesting, this discussion, and I think it's a very is, is a very challenging discussion because we are dealing with very different environments. Uh, we have a very strongly regulated systems with strong governance and strong enforcement. And in the South, we have very weak governance, very weak enforcement, sometimes regulation which is not enforced. So the, the, the challenges are different. Uh, and and I, my question is um, where the commonalities are, because uh, the challenge we have now dealing with communities in Europe, on my view, is more about how to liaise the soft governance structures that are emerging uh, community-based with the govern formal governance structures, right? And how the, va the domestic budgets are aligned with other forms of um, finance. And also innovating with finance from private sector and not the financial sector alone. For example, emerging ideas about changing business models in the insurance sector, right? So, I mean, I think there's a lot of things to learn from each other, but I still struggle a bit on the commonalities of the two systems and how we can take advantage of each other. So thank you very much. Uh, any other kind of questions that you want to raise? Yes, sir, at the back. My name is uh, Peter. I have worked with Obed for a long time, <laughs> and that's why I came here. I saw it from LinkedIn, and I said I must come and uh, see how. He was involved in training the community where I was working. I was managing Trokra projects, and uh, most of them were dealing with the climate change. Now, uh, the, another question is uh, a follow-up on awareness. How do we create messages? Because from my purview, Ireland is a very complicated, or Europe, 
at large is a complicated uh, public, so to speak, because we have the elderly, they will listen to mainstream uh, messaging, watching television at nine, at eight, at seven o'clock, and then reading the Irish Times, Irish Independent. What of the young, the youth? How do you message, create messages to them? What of the children? Actually, the missing gap is the children now because the future is theirs. Ourselves gathered here in this conference, we may not be there, but how do we message for them so that now when they grow up, they take up the responsibility. Then there is the middle class, the, the ones that love going to the pub for a booze. <laughs> they don't care, but they are there. And there are many. How do we message? I saw from LinkedIn uh, an advert from Dungavan. They have created a beer, and they have called it uh, Dungavan Green. And it is a very good messaging. I hope uh, Guinness and Jameson will take you from that. So how do we message climate change to the people? And my challenge always is, now COP28 is around the corner. You will see all the media now trying to focus, dedicate columns on, uh, and uh, t some space time on television to give focus on uh, COP. After that, dead. Or when a disaster mm -hmm. a a a appears, then all the cameras and everything, it goes there. Then after that, no feedback at all. So, and that is the missing point. The community, the local person, the household person at the local level, I have interacted with many. They are concerned, but the messaging. Very good, thank you. And one last point here, uh, Patrick, if you could just take the microphone and then we'll come back to the panel for a wrap up. So thank you. Uh, Patrick Monfray from uh, CNRS Paris. Um, I'm uh, <clears throat> thinking about uh, how we can uh, efficiently uh, reduce climate risk. It's both true for Europe and, and, uh, and uh, Africa, for example. Uh, the risk is uh, the mixing of climate hazards, the change in hazards, the exposure, and the vulnerability. So we should progress in these three angle uh, together. So uh, that means that if we think about the future of the climate, we know that the most biggest problem is the increase of the, vi the viability in terms of temperature, in terms of uh, draft and, or flooding, or, or the viability from one week to another week, from one month to another month, one year to another year. That's true everywhere, but we are entering this new type of viability, how far we will expose, how far we will, the different community could be uh, reduce their vulnerability to this new type of viability. It's a key thing, so that means we should progress together and have a better exchange on the progress that we are making in terms of vulnerability, exposure, and hazards together. And in this, uh, uh, in this aspect, uh, there, uh, there is a new initiative between Europe and uh, Africa, African Union and European Union, that uh, we are uh, opening uh, actually, and uh, uh, I will slide on that if you are interested. Okay, we'll come back to you because I know you've got a kind of an advert essentially to highlight to, to uh, colleagues at the end of the session, but thank you very much. Let me just ask to the panelists, which I think is an incredibly rich and challenging set of questions coming from audience members. Thank you very much. Maybe one minute each to pick one of the questions and have one reflection to give us enough time to close. Martha, do you want to start? I'll start and I'll do better than that. I'll, I'll address question one and four. Uh, so for me, I mean, I have a whole list of knowledge gaps here. Um, the, one of the biggest ones, I think, and again, speaking from my own perspective, from before I started to eight years in, almost eight years, communities we know are going to play a huge role in this climate adaptation um, uh, journey. And really, like, I think we need to activate and harness that energy and that, you know, action. 
And it's not going to happen when we have a lack of awareness of what climate change will actually mean in your area. We have like a lot of abstract notions about climate change, but actually when I saw the Office of Public Works maps showing parts of Maharese inundated, covered with water by the end of the century, that made me very motivated to protect this place that I love. So how do we inspire communities? I think one is to proper community level communication on what are the impacts here? And then that would surely motivate a lot of them to see what could they do. I find in Ireland, this information is held and cherished and protected by academics, state agencies, depart government departments who are writing all of these esoteric policies that communities are never going to read or access. So we need clear honest, accessible, timely information for communities to actually understand how adaptation is going to work for them. And it may mean they will have to relocate. But ultimately, isn't it better that we're preparing them now for a, a, you know, an adverse impact? I also want to say that taking communities seriously is so important in all of this. I have been to a lot of these types of workshops, and I find I'm usually the only community organization there. Um, we're talking to practitioners who are working with communities, government departments who are working with communities, but actually it's an honor to see a community group being invited to a forum like this. So I think more of that's essential because unless you understand how you, this actually works on the ground, I think you're missing something important. And, and, and in the last question, um, or the, the first question, um, in, in relation to accessing leader funding, we need a more coordinated ac approach and response between the state agencies. They're quite siloed. So in order to access leader funding, we have to have permission from the National Parks and Wildlife Service in our country because our site's a Natura 2000 site. So we have to have all kinds of appropriate assessments done to access a bit of funding, and we're just volunteers. So I think I went over my minute. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thomas, do you want to come in on? <coughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, but on two actually. Uh, the first, uh, also on the funding issue. I mean, theoretically at least, and I think hopefully, I'm, I'm a strong believer in that the missions are meant to really work on combining these funds and bringing that together. It, yes, the, the, the core funding comes from Horizon Europe, the Research and Innovation Fund. That's roughly, if things go well, around one billion per these five missions. So one billion for the adaptation mission over, over the course of seven years. Um, but that's roughly meant to be only a hundredth um, of what it needs to be leveraged to actually get somewhere. Um, so that's built in the underlining concept of the missions. Now, what I'm still not seeing properly at the moment how the mission is being rolled out now is that that has not been properly addressed yet. Uh, it's, it's, it's very much theory, um, both uh, at the commission level and, and them mobilizing their own um, troops and bringing the cohesion funds and uh, whatever the resilient recovery fund stuff together with the mission, but also at the project level that needs to work on that and also at the regional level. Um, so you, for me, and this is why I want to bring home the message that you know um, we need to, uh, and across the mission-related projects and actors, we should get together and really um, build on best practices and knowledge on how to mobilize these finances and provide capacity and, and empower the people at the local level to actually make use of that um, through different means, be it best practices, be it actually giving them resources to hire people to do it, or uh, you know services they then can acquire. So for me, that's a very, very important point, but it's really also meant, um, and there I hope the mission can also provide learnings that we can then feed back f to the commission. And, and by the way, I'm, we're focusing a lot between European and local level. Most, most amount of budget, actually, um, for adaptation issues still comes from the national government. And so that should be very much be involved as well in all this kind of thing. So that's one. Um, I like the question from. We need to be quick on time yes, now. Yes, you're right. OK, last, uh, maybe one last point on, um, on the, um, uh, from the Basque country. Uh, I, I was wondering as well, like, what are, what are the key things we can learn from each other in North South? 
I would have uh, thought and think and hope that one of the things we can from the north really learn from the south is the south has gone through transformational experience in this context. Europe is starting to grapple with the fact that it will probably and will likely have to do that, but it hasn't done it yet. So I, I was really hoping that we can learn from experiences of communities that actually went through transformational change in this context, and what are the best practices, what are things to learn to turn that into a positive and not a dystopian kind of process. Yeah, thank you. We, um we had an idea of been mapping out some of these areas in particular. For example, how do you support the relocation when it's, you know, a planned relocation? How do you design social protection, social welfare systems to support people in those contexts and adapt them in line with early warnings and so on? There's a lot, lot of different areas that I think in other parts of the world they've been tried and tested that could be learned from. But that's going to take a systemic approach. But maybe I can just turn to, to, to Shanaz and to, um, uh, Obed, sorry, my mind had gone blank for a moment. Um, Obed, which uh, I think the characterization that Europe is kind of heavy on governance and regulation and kind of softer on the softer systems and that Africa may be the alternative, is that, is that something that you recognize or how would you characterize the comparability between the experiences that you have in Kenya or in South Africa, for example, and, and what was described in Europe? Um, Obed, I'll go quickly. So, so I think it's a bit like that, uh, Tom, but I think people, particularly communities, not uh, government organizations, step in often because government is failing. And... Um, and so there's lots of st good stories to be told there, but I think at the same time, we do need the stronger governance as well. So I think it's happening because people are adapting. And I'd like to say it's really exciting, and I think we should be looking at peer-to-peer -peer exchanges between Africa, bringing some of those from Europe who want to learn more about what adaptation looks like on the ground, because often we're doing peer-to-peer -peer exchanges this way, which is south-south. I'd be very excited to do north-south peer exchanges. So just to put that on the table. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Obed, do you want to uh, come in with yeah, some Yeah, in addition to that, I, I think uh, uh, from um, the perspective of, of the south and, of course, uh, the intermediary that I work with, uh, CARE, one of the um, issues that I think can be also of, of a commonality is uh, how can we be sure, for instance, the adaptation projects on the ground are on the right track. Uh, many many NGOs, for instance, in the south are, are closely uh, doing uh, uh, local-led adaptation, but we need to think more carefully about how do we measure the success of these projects, for instance. Uh, when we measure it, uh, whose perspective are, are we measuring it from? From the donor's perspective, or based on logical framework, or from the community's perspective. Uh, of course, we, we know that effective mail is about building a common understanding uh, of partners on what constitutes success or failure and how to measure it, recognizing that donors, for instance, and communities may have different priorities. So I think this is one area that is really, really key. And, and, and of course, let's mention that measurement should be in service to meaningful learning that needs to be properly integrated into government and also NGO planning and delivery process. And I think this, this is an area that I think we can we could both learn from each other. And of course, also noting that uh, at globally, we are talking about uh, the, the global goal for adaptation, for instance, which we, which we still don't have in place, which still does have metrics and indicators for measuring adaptation. And, and I think this is something that we are grappling with, which, which, are, which is an area of commonalities that I think in, in both uh, global uh, south and, and, and north. And, and, and uh, maybe just to close or just to mention, uh, having working with a with a, with a, uh, an intermediary, of course, we really need to think our role as intermediaries, of course, by supporting local actors in whatever they need without us overstepping their their, their support uh, role as intermediaries. And I think which is really really important, uh, of course, adding to what Chenaz has already said uh, uh, in terms of uh, that question. Thank you so much, and it's really been a pleasure sharing with you. Sinead, any final words from you? Um, 
Only just to say, I think the messaging point, Peter, is hugely important. We do now have a, a cross-governmental climate communications group precisely for that uh, for that uh, issue. Um, and, and also, I think that the peer-to-peer -peer points, it, it may relate to, to the other announcement, but I know Africa Europe Foundation, for example, are looking at doing uh, you know, cross-learning on, on adaptation. We actually just got, got invited to something there. So, um, yeah, just, just uh, I think, great, great points. And, and I think just reinforces, uh, Tom, what you said earlier, that these communities need to be talking to each other. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And I think if I could just beg your, your uh, attention for one more moment, maybe, Patrick, I could invite you to give the, uh, the sense of an advertisement or the opportunity, which I think also does include a, an element of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, learning as well, as we've been describing. Um, so Patrick is from the French Ministry for Research. The exact title, I'm afraid, I've forgotten. Um, but that this is a particular advert for a program that is open and live at the moment that is about cooperation between Europe and West Africa and between multiple European countries and West Africa. Patrick, over to you. And if you could just help us with time as well. I yeah, know yeah. We're, we're running out. Yeah. Thank you very much to give uh, the opportunity uh, to present. Um, so um, it's a new initiative. Uh, that uh, is just starting. Uh, it was built uh, uh, between African Union and uh, European Union in the, in the STI partnership, the Science, Technology and Innovation Partnership that are uh, linking European Union and African Union. And by the way, the African countries with the European countries. They have started uh, since uh, two decades initiative on health, then agriculture, then sustainable energy, and now we are discussing to launch uh, climate change um, resilience and adaptation in this context. So uh, what is proposed is uh, to focus not uh, in a first step in all, uh, direct, in all regions in Africa, but focus on climate risk reduction uh, in West Africa uh, by launching first a suite of forum of uh, four thematics webinars. Uh, I have not real time to detail here, but uh, that will be organized in West African countries by the Africans, but in also in cooperation with uh, European partners. In fact, there is a lot of bilateral cooperation with one European countries and one African uh, countries related to climate uh, uh, risk, of course. And the idea is how we can uh, share uh, knowledge and practices and better align bilateral to multilateral activities if possible, where possible in a very pragmatic way. So it's really addressing research innovation, but also capacity building, uh, both in coastal, urban, and rural areas, because urbanization is also a key component in African development. Uh, it's identified priorities for joint vision and multilateral action to promote South-South cooperation, North-South, and I would uh, add also uh, in this uh, uh, session the South-North, because we have to uh, also learn from the South, definitely. Um, it's to feed uh, these four webinars. Uh, they will identify um, uh, priorities related, related to research, innovation, and capacity building, but also propose short-term actionable, actionable steps that could be supported by different uh, instruments, including multilateral call. Um, so a stock taking conference is, uh, uh, is uh, expected uh, uh, early next year. And in the, the broad agenda is to contribute also to the, Afri the new African Union, European Union innovation agenda uh, that we will be uh, launched uh, uh, I think in a uh, in, uh, in few months, where uh, climate services for risk reduction have put in a different uh, blocks, including um, to organize a meeting uh, to listen from the African actors and practices, and also uh, engage uh, in a broader sense uh, the citizen and, uh, and the field actors, and link also the progress in research with the development uh, trajectories, how far we can include um, adaptation and resilience strategy into uh, African development trajectories. Thank you. If you are interested, there is uh, two email uh, 
uh, that are on the screen. Thank you very Patrick, much. Patrick, thank you. Thank you very much. Very exciting. And I think I'd also just reinforce that the Africa-EU partnership on innovation, particularly around climate change, is a real opportunity to build these bridges of north-south, south-north cooperation as well. So I think fascinating to bring this in. Thank you very much. And maybe just in terms of the, the timing of our panel, we've got a final closing word from Alex, and then we'll let you go. And apologies for running a bit late. Patrick, thank you. And If you want any more information on that, please do um, look at the connections there on the screen. Alex, over to you in closing words. So just bear with me a second. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so um, thank you very much. I think it has been quite a useful and inspiring uh, session. Um, just want to wrap up the session by saying a few words uh, of things. So first of all, I would like to thank the speakers and the panelists. I think it... Uh, it was a very engaging uh, discussion, and some really interesting thoughts uh, came out of the of the discussion. So thank you very much. Uh, I would also like to thank my colleagues Helen O'Connor, who's here today with us, Sam Green, uh, and Aaron Aruda from uh, IID, who were instrumental also in organizing this uh, this session. So thank you very much for your help. Um, the technical team that has been uh, quite helpful also, so th thank you, and the, the team from the, uh, the Royal Irish Academy, mainly you. Um, so a word of thanks to them as well. And finally, uh, last but not least, for sure, to the participants and to the, to the questions and reflections you shared uh, with the panel and with the rest of the participants and the inputs to the poll. I think it has been some interesting food for thought, and hopefully this will be uh, the first step of uh, future engages and interactions on this topic. So um, if you're interested, please stay tuned uh, that IID Europe and IID will uh, do some more work on that, and we'll be happy to share that with you if you're interested. Um, just a final word to highlight um, some of the uh, events that, so as you may know, uh, London Climate Action Week starts next week and it lasts until early July. Um, I'm not going to go, for the sake of time, through all the events that IID is organizing at um, London Climate Action Week, but I would like to call your attention specifically to one that will take place on the 29th of June next week on delivering locally led adaptation lessons from the front line of climate action. So this uh, brings also uh, some of the key messages from CBA and the Gon Shoda conference on locally led adaptation uh, and how these learnings and insights can be shared uh, within the UK, but also in Europe. Um, so it's a bit um, a direct link with the, with the session that we hosted today. Uh, you can find more information about that and all the other events on the IID website. Um, so if you're interested, I would encourage you to check that. Um, yeah, and I think that's it for me. I mean, personally, it was quite a pleasure to see this discussion and hopefully, as I, I was mentioning, uh, this will is just the first step of a hopefully ongoing conversation. So thank you very much again for, for your attention and for being here. And uh, I wish you a good day. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>